Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm introducing a new project. It is a podcast, and it is going to be a podcast that focuses exclusively on strategy games. I'd say there will be a focus on war games, uh, but from uh, from a podcast perspective, it'll be looking at strategy games. Uh, it's going to be me, the Historical Gamer, you can call me Matt, and Jean, the Strategy War Gamer, who will be my co-host in this venture uh, as we look at uh, discussing various topics from current events to strategy uh, to the types of drinks that we enjoy, as you might guess from the title. Uh, so, Jean, uh, how are you doing? Not bad, Matt. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, today, uh, we've got a couple of, uh, topics on our agenda, but I think the first thing that makes a lot of sense is, uh, just giving you guys a little bit of an intro of, of who we are. So, um, why don't, uh, I'll turn it over to you, John, and you can kind of introduce who you are and, uh, what you do. And, uh, then you can, I'll come back and talk a little bit about myself. All right. Awesome. Um, so, um, I'm originally, uh, my name is John, and uh, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I currently live in uh, Virginia, um, and uh, I've worked in the technology field for a couple of years. I uh, worked for Apple, and um, and now I'm uh, kind of pursuing uh, education. Uh, I've always been into uh, historical strategy games since, oh, geez, uh, probably the 90s, since uh, Sega Genesis, uh, and... Um, my first uh, war game, which I believe was uh, PTO, which I still remember to this day playing. What's that uh, stand for? Uh, Pacific Theater of Operations. I don't know if uh, I don't know if many people in our audience are familiar with it, but it was out for the Sega Genesis uh, first, and um, uh, I remember you know we were talking about it a couple of nights ago, and uh, it was uh, one of the first really cool uh, games because I was a little bit into uh, history. Uh, well, I was a lot into history. I would say probably. Uh, uh, the movie Gettysburg got me into history, uh, and I kind of somehow moved into World War II. But um, the real thing that really got me was uh, when I started playing this game was that it was like a, a sandbox game. And it was kind of like, um, it's for the Sega Genesis, I remember. And, and uh, when I put it in, it was like, hey, it's 1941, or I think 1936 even. And it was like, here's the Pacific Fleet. Japan just attacked us have at it go you have to uh you know kind of protect us and uh, end the war and it was just it, it kind of gave you control as like nimitz to kind of win the war and develop strategies um and, it, and i always thought this was probably the best war game uh best game ever made probably uh for the uh, consoles because a lot of people were crazy about like super mario brothers and stuff like that but pto is uh holds a special place in my heart because it was like it did something else. It kind of made you actually use your brain. It was not like, all right, let me get the mushroom, and then this way I can fly <laughs> around the board. It was like, okay, well, i got to send this fleet over to Midway because the Japanese have four carriers there, and I have to put two of my carriers. You know, it kind of had you think at a higher intelligence level. And uh, But did it ask you to get the green mushroom so you could get an extra life? <laughs> Maybe if you went to Guadalcanal, I might have had one there. <laughs> But uh, it was an incredible game, and then I kind of moved on and um, went to Liberty or Death, and then uh, I've been playing strategy games uh, ever since then, all the way up to uh, the current uh, desktop games. So, uh, and since uh, the last probably 2013 or is it 2012, uh, I started a, a, my website at strategywargamer.com um, to uh, just like kind of review games, uh, and I always try to find games that people don't know about. Like I uh, currently, I'm reviewing. Uh, Hearts of Iron Forge, Solaris, which are really cool games. Um, but I always like trying to find um, niche games that most people don't know about. Uh, uh, I just did a first impressions of a game called Brooklyn 1776. And uh, it wasn't like the greatest game in the world, but it was uh, done by an indie developer and uh, it kind of took a different perspective on the Battle of Brooklyn. So games like that really uh, fire my passions because. Uh, we all know about the bigger games, but I think the smaller games uh, are also uh, are kind of where innovation lies, and also uh, um, pique my interest. Cool. Well, uh, you know, I know you mentioned Stellaris and Paradox, uh, or Stellaris and Hearts of Iron. With 
I think we might be getting to the point where Paradox, we can no longer consider a small developer or an indie developer because, <laughs> you know, they're talking about how Stellaris sold 200,000 units in the first couple of days after launch and uh, Hearts of Iron sold 200,000 units in like the first two weeks. So I think that it's rare to see a strategy game with those kind of figures, but um yeah, I mean, that's interesting that you kind of talk about that background for yourself because, uh, you know, I'm a historical gamer. My name is Matt, um, and I have a similar background. So I would say kind of the first game that I really remember getting me into wargaming is probably Panzer General. Um, and that was from a console perspective. So it's interesting that you came to wargaming from PTO playing the Genesis. Um, when I was 13, I got a PlayStation 1 uh, for my for a birthday present. And, uh, you know, this is back in the day, I think it was like $99 or something like that. Um, and I remember, you know, the first, my birthday, we went to a Milwaukee Brewers game. I'm from Wisconsin and, I uh, got a PlayStation and we had an all night event where we played Madden and AAA baseball and like all these different games. But then shortly after I got the system, I saw a game that was called Panzer General and my dad was in the military. He retired a colonel and, you know, my mom was always really into the civil war and Egyptian, Egyptian history as well. And I always had this fix for history and I could never really identify why, but I remember I was going through, I think it was a Toys R Us and I saw a game that was on the rack and it was called Panzer General. I was like, that looks really interesting. So I picked it up and, uh, you know, as I'm sure most of our listeners would know what Panzer General is, it's a it's a turn-based strategy game that puts you in the shoes of a German general uh, in a branching campaign that goes from 1939 all the way to the conclusion of the war, be it an invasion of the United States or Berlin falling to the Russians. But hmm. I ended up playing this game, it's called Panzer General on PlayStation, a console game. Which, you know, take that into account. We don't see a lot of strategy games on consoles, but Panzer General, the first, the original, on my original PlayStation, and I just, it was this, it's it's this part of, you know, me. It's it's this childhood uh, remembrance. And I know 13, not really childhood. But anyway, I remember for, the, for two or three years, like every year during the summer, school lets out, baseball starts. I'm a huge baseball fan, by the way. Um, and I would play Panzer General. I would listen to Bob Euchre on the radio announcing spring training, regular season Brewers games as I play through Panzer General. And I, I even like drew up my own little map of Europe and kind of filled in countries as I took them over. So that was kind of what what uh, what defined kind of my first intro into strategy gaming. And from there it expanded. So I actually got the first Civil War Generals. Uh, which I think is a, a little bit lesser known of a title. Civil War Generals 2 is really popular with people, but I actually got the first one. And then I got the second one as well, Civil War Generals 2, which had kind of a branching 40 turn-based uh, battles uh, campaign where you could play through from, uh, uh, what was it? Oh, I forgot the name of the battle, but it was before Bull Run. It was like a fairy. It was a Blackburn yeah. Ford or something like that. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, I remember that. I um, that yeah, so it's like, oh, there's 3,000 people involved. Let's include this one battle, but, you know, the only <laughs> battle in the Overland campaign is the wilderness. But anyway, um, so I played I played through that, you know, through that game. Um, and I remember actually I ended up deleting, uh, I was going through my computer when I got Civil War Generals 2, so I played one, Civil War Generals 1, which is really just like seven battles. It was, you know, it was like Bull Run, Bull Run, you know, Second Manassas, uh, Antietam, Gettysburg, uh, Wilderness, and I think Shiloh, and uh, maybe Chickamauga. I can't really quite remember, but it was just like seven really big battles in the Civil War. And then it ended up uh, creating that sequel, and these were games made by SSI. And I remember when I got Civil War Generals 2, I went in and I ended up deleting... I was trying to free up hard drive space. I didn't have enough hard drive space. So I ended up going through my computer and trying to, you know, find, okay, what can I free up some space from? And ended up deleting Windows.exe. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that, people. That's a mistake. This that is like... time when you could still <laughs> Yeah, right? When you had access to those files. This was, I think it was a Windows... Was it when... Might have been a Windows 95. I think it was before Windows 95. Um, but ended up doing that and... You know, all of a sudden, oh, blue screen of death. I'm like, uh, we can't find the command that Just opens up Windows. <laughs> it's like, um, shit. 
uh, Dad, I just deleted the executable file on uh, on this computer, and uh, you know this is before restore files, so there's no real way to restore yeah, the machine. Um, <laughs> so you know, I'd say that game kind of defined kind of. You know, I would say Panzer General got me interested in war games. C- Civil War Generals Two solidified my my interest, and then Sid Meier's Gettysburg and PTO Two. Uh, so you mentioned PTO. There's a connection there with me. PTO two uh, really kind of brought me full bore into hell. Yeah, I'm ready for strategy war gaming. <laughs> and um, you know, uh, Sid Meier's Gettysburg had a funny story where it's like I got this game, I bought it, knowing that my computer at home could not play this game. Oh, so wow. I I That's foisted weird. I foisted my my passion for history and war gaming upon my friends who lived across the street. And down the street, who had computers that could play the machine. So I ended up installing it on both of their computers. And I remember one night, like, so we had an N64, and we were playing um, Zelda. This is like back in Ocarina of Time, Zelda days. And we were playing Zelda on the on the big screen, 50-inch, flat-inch screen TV. And in the den, which was adjacent to it, we were playing my copy of Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Uh, through the night, like an all-nighter, like we're 14 or 15 years old, and uh, we're just, you know, from like 9 p.m. to like 4 in the morning, we're playing through the entire Battle of Gettysburg. While, you know, you know it's like three or four of us, and like one of us is playing Zelda and, you know, playing through, you know, Mario, as you said. You know, you mentioned like back in the in the console days, like people playing Mario. Um, we were playing through, people were playing, playing Zelda, and people were playing... Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Just this bizarre combination. You wouldn't think of like a 13 or a 14 year old playing like a Civil War Gettysburg game. We were playing through that and I would say that's kind of a defining period where like I played it on my friend's machines because mine couldn't run it. And then PTO2 which I found through like a secondary market um, where I installed this game and it was just it was fascinating. And I, I'm sorry I know I'm going far more into my, my own war gaming history than you did. But um, I apologize for that. But um I ended up playing PTO2. I got it on this machine. It was a secondary game. You know, I just found it like a bargain mid somewhere. And I, the thing that interested me the most about it was, as you said, it puts you in the role of Nimitz. So it's like, all right, where am I going to move my carriers? Where am I going to invade? What's the difference between PTO1 and PTO2? You know, I don't remember. I, I never played PTO1, so it's hard for me to say. But the thing that struck me the most was the cabinet meetings. So the fact that you had, you literally, at the end of a season, at the end of a year, you'd have these kind of animated discussions. You were playing as the Japanese, or if you are playing the U.S., you know, you are playing with Roosevelt, Marshall, where you had to negotiate to say, like, okay, the Army gets this amount of resources and this amount of budget, and, you know, the Navy gets this and this. And it was fascinating to me that, that deeper, con- and I didn't even realize what I was, what I was witnessing I say witnessing in a very loose term because, you know, it's a game. You know, you're witnessing whatever you decide to witness. But this this idea of intergovernmental uh, conflict over resources and priorities and objectives. Um, and it's just – it's a much deeper layer, I think, um, than, than you would see in most games where you really get to dictate what's the course going to go. What are your objectives? What are the resources you have to accomplish those objectives? And how are you going to go about doing that? And to me, that was just the ultimate immersion into a game. And then um, uh, the ability also the game allows you to kind of design your own ships as well, which is kind of kind of unique. Uh, but oh, that was really? kind of that was uh, well. Not, I, don't one to, did that. I don't know if design is the right word, but like there was a ship component, and I, I, my memory is is hazy because it's hard for me to to think back to you know fifteen years ago, but. Um, there was some sort of element there where you could kind of control ship design uh, components. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's pretty sick, actually. Yeah, and I, it wasn't a flat-out, like, redesign, but I know there was there was something to it. And, you know, that game actually caused me to fall in love. I, I did a few RPGs online, not many, but I ended up finding in the process of that, finding a, a, a program called Spring Sharp where you kind of design your own ships and, you know, trying to get involved with a few online RPGs that never ended up panning out because, you know, the admins were full of shit. Uh, but it, uh, it, it introduced me to a... Uh, um, a couple of interesting programs where you could kind of go through designing your own ships and actually uh, rule the waves. Uh, I, I feel like 
kind of fulfilled my itch for that like the game never that never came but that, that's a different discussion um so yeah i would really say that uh kind of Panzer General was the first war game that I got into. Sid Meier's Gettysburg and PTO were kind of influential in creating, you know, the war gamer that I am today. And uh, War in the Pacific as well, the free version that Matrix provided. I remember I downloaded that one day. I was like, oh, this is awesome. They're providing this game for free. And I ended up playing it from like, I, it was a school night, by the way. I ended up playing from like 8 p.m. to like 4 in the morning and <laughs> really hating myself the next morning when I had to go to school. Um, but you know, I ended up playing through that and it was just the, the depth, the, 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 the impact that your decisions had. Cause I think one thing that a lot of strategy games don't have is that you make a decision that doesn't really affect anything. I mean like, okay, it affects the individual conflict battle that you fight in, but it doesn't really affect the, the long-term course of the engagement. And I think that was, a, that was a common trait that all these games had. Um, when, when you were talking about ship designer for PTO, the first thing that popped in my head was, uh, the, um, I don't know if you're familiar, they, they came out with like, um, well, uh, Paradox was making uh, East vs. West for uh, uh, a couple years back, um, and it just got canceled. I think it was last year it got canceled. Uh, but one really interesting thing that really just got me really excited about this game was um, that you could... Um, build a ship in like I don't know I think it was like 1954 like if you made like a uh, SX class ship and you might have upgraded it you can keep it around throughout all these years uh, and then but modify it you can say all right well the Enterprise is going to be out there for 10 years and then you know what I have better class ships I have Nimitz class ships coming back and you can say you know what I have the Enterprise come back I'm going to remodify her, add a couple of new things to her, uh, give her new weapons, uh, new planes on her, and then still have her as an active duty ship. So you can actually continue ships that have been around for 10, 20 years. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Upgrade them. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know about it, um, that, but you can literally, um, I have to post a link somehow, um, you can literally download the game because it, it was out in beta. Uh, it, there was actually a website, and I'll put a link for it, um, where you can actually download the game. There's some people who are still working on it. And it's <laughs> um, trying to build a uh, build it and finish it. Uh, but you can download the beta and actually do a, a test play. I don't think there's any music to it, uh, and it's definitely in beta because it does crash quite a bit. But you can actually get a taste of what the game would have been like if it were ever released. Oh, that's kind of that's really cool, especially to me that like modifying continuous improvement of uh, of the ship that that you have there is really cool because um, I don't think a lot of people realize that you know the Essex class is built during World War II and and we kind of think of Cold War aircraft carriers as you know these massive super class you know Nimitz class carriers, but it, uh, the the last Nimitz class or sorry the last Essex classed carriers weren't decommissioned until the mid 1970s. I mean, those things lasted for 30 years and obviously, you know, the uh what was it? The I think it might have been the Hancock or the Ticonderoga. Um they changed names between the two ships. Uh but I think that was the last. I could be wrong here, but just based on back of the napkin kind of just searching through. Uh those are uh actually no, sorry, it would have been the Oriskany. But either way, the last uh, Essex-class carriers were in service for like 30 years, and people don't think about those serving throughout through the majority of the Cold War. And I want to say the last of the Midway class, which were World War II-class carriers as well, served through like Persian Gulf One or something Jeez. like that. Really? So I could be wrong there, but it was certainly through toward a, the tail end of the Cold War. Um, and I, I, that's a neat thing that a game would, would factor in. And actually, Rule the Waves, uh, which is kind of a turn-based have you played World of Waves, by the way? No, I haven't played it. No. Is it what uh, publisher or developer? <sighs> you know, I don't know the actual name of the developer. They're the same people who made... Um, oh, my God, I can't think of it. Um, Steam and Iron. The same uh, developer made Steam and Iron. Uh, uh, but it's sold through Naval NWS.com, so Naval Warfare Simulations. Uh, okay. So yeah. it's not through Steam or anything like that. But um, it's... It's kind of a very niche uh, game. It's it's almost like a borderline text simulation, but not quite. 
Um, but they uh, that that's a similar game where you build these fleets and uh, Rule the Waves is really interesting because it puts you in the shoes of a admiral in charge of a fleet from 1900 till like 1920 or something like that uh, through you know these massive changes that are occurring in naval warfare. Uh, but it you, it allows you to modify designs. So you know as, as new technological developments come in, you can replace equipment to make ships more efficient. You can do rebuilds of ship. You can reformat ships so that you know they modernize themselves so that they're not quickly out of date because realistically like you build a battleship in 1905 it's, it's obsolete in real world by 1910 if you don't make any changes um so that's a it's an interesting uh, component there where you're kind of talking about that ability to modernize whatever happened to east versus west um that was a uh, this was a game that I was following since like day one since it was announced because uh i you know i'm a, I'm a heart to iron uh, fanatic. I, I, I played Hearts Iron once since I think like the day it came out. I think it was like, literally launch day and uh, Hearts Iron 2, 3 and now we're on 4. Uh, but one thing that was always driving me nuts was like, alright, I want to continue playing the game beyond 1948. <laughs> I don't want to be like limited. I want to go from 48 all the way to, I don't know, Persian Golf. It would be awesome. Um, and then I think somewhere around 2013 or 2014, Paradox said, hey, by the way, we're fulfilling that fantasy you all have we're going to make East vs. West. It's going to take uh, the Korean War, Vietnam, and then I think all the way into the Persian Gulf. Um, and it was going to be incredible because I was just like, man, this this is a game I've been waiting for since like forever. Uh, and then uh, I remember the first thing that popped up was like, hey, by the way, the developers came on. They were like, hey, by the way, we have a delay. Um, we Things came up. We have to change certain things. And delay is fine. You know, like every company, if they have a delay... You know, take that time, brush it up. There have been a couple of games like uh, Uncharted 4 had a delay and, you know, they released it. Hey, I I work in product development for a cell phone carrier, so believe me, every single thing that you ever release is delayed somewhat. Um, But, like, when did you... Obviously, East vs. West never came out, or at least hasn't thus far. No, but I knew it was going to fail after the second. Once once a product gets ended up at the second point where you have to actually make a press release and say, by the way, we're going to have to delay the game again. I knew something was wrong. And then uh, I think uh, the third time they were saying uh, that, I think it was like January 2015 or 2014. I I forgot exactly what year. But uh, they said that uh, the game was not going to be released by conventional means. It was going to be released as a beta. I mean, Wait, they said it wasn't going to be released via conventional means? Are you seriously? Yeah, I remember reading on the... Uh, and this was a couple of years back, so I might be a little bit hazy, but I remember them making a post saying the game is not going to be released by conventional means. It was going to be released <laughs> as a beta or something like that. And then if... The I'm sorry, is, that's just... That's, that's very, ridiculous. I know. You know when they say something like that, it's out of desperation. I was like, holy crap. And I had a feeling like this was not even going to pan out. They were like, it's going to be released as a beta. If there's enough support, we'll kind of push it through and make a release. And then I think like wow. a month or two later, Paradox was like, yeah, we're niching it. Goodbye. And it just, it just kind of tanked. And uh, I think I had, a, I had an interview with uh, Johan uh, a couple years back and I asked him, I said, what happened? He, uh, um, I forgot exactly what he said, but he said something like uh, that uh, the, the game wasn't up to Paradox standards in terms of uh, gameplay uh, bugs. Uh, there were a lot of bugs. Uh, he was saying, and if you play the game now, there there are quite a few. Um, and it's been in development for so uh, quite a while. And uh, I think this is a time where Hard to Iron Four was going to come around, so they were putting their resources on the project. So well, I totally understand where they're coming from. So yeah, and I mean, from a uh, you know, I I know I was laughing as far as uh, <laughs> kind of what you were saying, but at the same time, I I, I kind of feel for him, like. Okay, I I don't East versus West wasn't being developed by Paradox themselves, right? It was like a third party developer. Yeah, I think it's like uh, BL Logic or something like that. Okay, so I mean, like Paradox, you put yourself in Paradox's shoes, and you know they're working with this developer who claims they're making this game, and you know who knows? I don't know if they're using a Paradox Engine or anything like that, but you know, product's not ready. We're gonna have to delay. Okay, fine. You know that's software. That's what happens, right? Um, but okay, we're delaying again. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, you're delaying again. Okay, fine, but, like, when is it going to be out? And then a third delay? And it's kind of like, okay, you know, 
you know, who knows? For all we know, Paradox is funding this development. If they're if they're if they're writing them a check and saying like, okay, we'll pay for you to pay your bills, you know, while you're developing this, and it just keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Eventually, you know, it sucks because it sounds like a really cool game, like something I I haven't you know done anything with the the beta, but it sounds like something that'd be really awesome to dive into. But at some point, you know, especially if they're funding it, I don't know if they were, you know, maybe they weren't. But at some point, a publisher's got to be like, listen, enough's enough. you, you got to give us a product that we can launch. And if not, you know, we're going to have to fish and cut bait. You know, we're going to we're gonna have to move on. I was hoping that they would um, – this was around the time that uh, Steam Project Greenlight, I think it's what, that's what it's called. Uh, but, you know, like we have a lot of Steam games out right now, and I, I think yeah. it's called the Greenlight, I think. Uh, I might be wrong by the name, but, it, you know, like a lot of games are coming out in alpha version and uh, to fund the actual game, um, like you have Daisy, I think, and there's a whole bunch of other games on Steam right now. They're still in the alpha project or a beta and uh, people are buying them for like 20 or 30 dollars in alpha or beta format. Uh, they're barely playable, but people, uh, there are these communities that revolve around this project because like, look. Daisy, you could just do this or just do that, and it's not a full game, but we love the concept. We know where this game is going. We love it so far. I'm willing to shed 30 or 40 bucks for it and then you know, continue the project. And I was hoping that maybe East vs. West would say, look, we're going to do this. If you want this game, you could pay $30. We're in alpha. It's probably going to take us a couple of years. They would get a continuous revenue stream to pay their bills, you know, the light bills, whatever. But you would have the game that you can sort of play right now. It would have tons of bugs and most of the features would be there, but eventually it'll be done and you'll get that final version once it comes out, but never happened. It would have been interesting to see them go that route. Um, I know this wasn't really on what we're planning on talking about, um, but I think in, in almost my perfect vision of what should green light be or what should like early access be on steam? And I think a, a, a you kind of went the route of like, okay, they can fund the bills while they continue development and that allows them to finish the product. But I almost feel like that's a negative thing. It's like, okay, you know, this isn't really finished yet, but it's a concept. It kind of works and you can sort of play it, but it doesn't really work, but give us money. Um, (laughs) To me, that's a problem. But if I was to say like, what was one game? Like, if I looked at any early access game that I ever spent money on, I thought, you know, that was money well spent. Like, my feedback was really used, and they made this game way better than it ever could have been. It's a game I've been playing a lot of uh, lately, and I know we had been talking about, like, okay, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about, you know, this is more of a discussion at this point than a podcast, everyone, so sorry for that. But (laughs) one of the games that, uh, one of the things that we had talked about discussing in this, uh, Jean, and, uh, it was what are you playing lately? And as anybody who's been following my live streams, uh, which I haven't done lately, but um, what I've been playing a lot of lately is Buzz Aldrin Space Program Manager. And have you, have you played that at all? Um, no, I haven't played it. I've seen screenshots in some video of it. I haven't, I haven't gotten to that. Okay. Well, it's a it's more or less a modern remake of Race into Space, which is like a early 90s type game where you it's kind of the space race. So basically you play as either the Russians or the so or, sorry, well, Russians or Soviets, the same damn thing. Brilliant uh, historical gamer. Um you play as either the United States or you play as either the Russians and you're trying to get to the moon first. And Buzz Aldrin Space Program Manager is a modern remake. Uh you know Buzz Aldrin's involved in it as well, which is kind of cool. Um, in which you play as either the Russians or the Americans. But the original game was actually just this global space agency idea. It was this idea where, like, okay, let's take some interesting spacecraft. You know, let's take the Sputnik, you know, the R7 Russian rocket, and let's take the Saturn V rocket. And we're just going to create this hypothetical 1950s global space agency, whatever the hell that would be. Um, and, and try and get to the moon. And that's the concept of the game. It's like, where you're put in charge of a global space agency formed in the 1950s to try and get to the moon. Sorry, but I don't know if anyone knows anything about history says, like, any of that is remotely even f- feasible. But the game took feedback from users and, like, hey, you know, this is a cool game. It's It's an interesting concept, but 
it's not a space race. It's not the 1950s. It's not the 1960s, unless you have the U.S. and the Soviets competing against each other to try and get to the moon first. And this is sort of this early access concept that Matrix said, okay, let's try this out. You know, a lot of other companies are doing this. Let's, let's figure out what happens when we do it. And they did it. And the product they ended up releasing was just that. It was a space race game that was the U- you could play as the U.S., you could play as the Soviets, and you could still play as a global space agency trying to get to the moon. But originally it was just like literally the only thing it was was the GSA, Global Space Agency, playing against the clock to try and get to the moon before their budget ran out or whatever. And it ended up turning into a legitimate space race game where you're playing as the Soviets or the Russians, you're trying to, or Soviets or the Americans, I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Soviets or the Americans, and you're trying to get to the moon before the, the opposition. And they have the GSA option where you could you know, mix and match space components. But that was almost like the perfect example. And I know our, our topic isn't really going to be discussing um, you know, early access. But that was almost the perfect example of like, how do you use early access? Well, the developer has this concept of a game and the consumers say, great, but this isn't really compelling. This isn't really what the space race was all about. So here's how you should change it. And they did. They did. They implemented it. They built the game out in full detail. And I have to give full credit. And I I, I don't know how successful the game has been for Matrix or Slytherin or whatever the hell we want to call them. But that was in my mind, like the perfect way to use early access. And I kind of, you know, I regret that East versus West didn't have that. Um, because the idea of a Cold War Hearts of Iron game is really appealing, but it doesn't exist. And, you know, I, I kind of shifting gears going back to Hearts of Iron, I wonder, like, do you think that's the direction Hearts of Iron 4 is going? Because, you know, Hearts of Iron 4 just came out, what, like a month ago or so, or maybe a little bit more? Um, and it seems yeah. to be kind of like, what, 1936 to 1950, but really it's more like 1936 to 1945, because uh, it's really just a World War II sim. Like, where do you yeah. think that's going? I mean, uh, honestly, I think the, um, I know, uh, I mean, I, I, I was hoping to get, uh, I, I submitted a interview to, uh, um, Paradox, uh, I think like a week, a week and a half ago, I was hoping to get it back, uh, for a podcast so, so I can, uh, uh, you know, answer that question. Because one of the questions I gave him was like, Hey, are, are you guys looking for expansion packs that go beyond 48 to include maybe at least the Korean war? Um, but I haven't gotten that back yet. Um. But what I, I I feel honestly deep down inside, I feel that Paradox um, uh, is going to uh, incorporate more. I think a, a reason why they shut down East vs. West is like, look, we're about to start Hearts Iron 4. We're about like halfway through developing it. You're using the old engine. You're using the old mechanics of this game. Um, by the time you're done, we're already going to come out with Hearts Iron 4, so it's going to be kind of like you're the old generation and you know we have these new gameplay mechanics, which is what we want every game to have, and you're already, you, know, you already have the old mechanics and it just doesn't mesh together. So I, I have a feeling that what they're going to, what they wanted to do is, I have a feeling what they're going to do is they're going to strip East vs. West, take all the AI or whatever they did out of it, Add it to it as an expansion pack to Hearts of Iron 4, or maybe as a sequel to Hearts of Iron 4, but with this new, because uh, they changed a lot in Hearts of Iron 4 um, compared to Hearts of Iron 3. Uh, it's almost like it's almost like a completely new game from, uh, you know, like, because I played Hearts of Iron 3 a lot, and, yeah. and I feel like it's a completely different game uh, in a lot of aspects. So I feel like what they're going to do is they're going to modernize East vs. West with the gameplay mechanics of Hearts Iron 4. So that's, I think that's where they're heading, honestly. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll admit I never really play. I have Hearts of Iron 2 on a CD. Uh, yes, <laughs> an actual CD. Um, and I have Hearts of Iron 3 on Steam. And I think if you look at my Steam account, I've played it like for 30 minutes. Not because I disliked it. It was just one of those things where like, I mean, I think I'm guilty. I'm guessing you're probably guilty as well. Steam summer sale comes around. Everything's like five cents. I'm going to yeah. buy like 80 games and never touch <laughs> half of them. <laughs> um, so, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm guilty. guilty of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but then when Hearts of Iron 4 came out, I really kind of fell into that. I think I played like 20 hours in the first two or three days that it was out. 
And um, holy crap, that's way more than I should spend time on playing a video game. Anyway, um, so I ended up like diving deep into Hearts of Iron 4, and I found it really appealing. But to me, it almost seemed like, okay... 1936 isn't an early enough starting date. Like, if I really want to mold the economy of Italy or Germany, like, I need more than three years before World War starts. Um, And at the same time, sometimes World War ended in 1943, 1944, and it didn't really feel like the game was over. It felt just like kind of an intermission. And sometimes you'd get a World War III going, and some of the tech kind of spread to 1950. So it almost felt like, like, naturally... They need an expansion to go to 1920 like, or something like that, and they need an expansion to go to like 1970 or like 1980. Maybe not quite that far, but like at least like into the 60s. Um, the problem is the game engine, the way it's set up, is you basically you get your World War going, and then you may have a piece, uh, but then it's really World War II sequel. Like it's not World War Three, it's not the Cold War, it's not any proxy fighting. It's just you know. We hit pause on the war, and now we decided to restart it. Um, so they need some diplomatic aspects to, to, to get added to the game um, to make it feel like it's a Cold War game. But um, I think, you know, naturally the, the first expansions that you, they should, and I don't know where Paradox is going with this, but the, the natural expansions they should have are a Cold War and a interwar expansion to kind of give you more ability to mold your economy and your, your military force, because three years isn't enough time, frankly. Um, but then also, like after the initial conflict happens, there needs to be something at the end of that, because it doesn't really seem like it's a natural stopping point when most of those conflicts end. I think if they incorporate uh, Victoria, because Victoria, uh, have you ever played Victoria? Yeah. Yeah, I played, I remember uh, back on the, yeah, I had a machine that I played Victoria 1 on. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, what Pops did, or anything like that, well before I fell in love with strategy games. Actually, Silent Hunter 3 was another game that really kind of reinvigorated me and got me really into more deep strategy, but but not taking time away from that. Um, Yeah, Victoria was one of those games I kind of like saw and played, but didn't really know what the hell I was doing when I was in college. I was just like, hey, this is kind of (laughs) cool. Um, but yeah, played Victoria, played Victoria two, uh, did a review for, uh, the wargamer.com for that. Um, but, but yes, to answer your question in, uh, me not taking up 20 minutes, uh, the answer is yes. I, uh, one, one really cool thing. I, I mean, if they incorporate Victoria two, the mechanics, uh, for the peaceful years for like, you know, like, like you were saying into war or a cold war where you can develop the economy, you know, like work on your population and then you know every in a cold war you do have like uh crises it's like you have like the korean war and you have vietnam and then you have uh, little things in between like small wars like panama and stuff like that that could uh occupy the player for those little areas before the uh, next war hits if they kind of bring that m- mechanics of victoria because uh, that's what victoria did i mean you have the mexican war if you play the u.s and then you have a big between 1936 and 1961 you have a big period and they figure like well let's work on the economy let's work on population uh, infrastructure of the country um and that's what a lot of people worked on um during those uh, interwar periods i feel if they incorporate that into hard to iron um, that'll that'll take you know that'll keep the player busy yeah i i think i agree with all that um i think you know my initial reaction is it's almost like a separate game but I think if you look at the way that Paradox handled Crusader Kings 2, um, they've been able to somehow, I don't know how the hell they've done it. They've done a very good job. Uh, they somehow changed, was a very limited, was like 12, 20, or like somewhere like early you know, 13th century uh, to 15th century simulation into, oh, well, we're actually going to start in the 900s and go to like 1500. Um, they've done a very good job of completely changing what the original game was and redefining it. And somehow through DLCs, completely changing that experience. So they're going to have to do something like that, you know, with, with Hearts of Iron 4, if they really want to be able to model a Cold War type game, there are some substantial changes they're going to need to make. There's going to be a need, there's going to need to be a model that 
handles proxies and that handles sort of the Iron Curtain mentality of building up a, an alliance of like NATO, like all these things that don't really apply to World War II that will need to be incorporated into the Cold War. But I think based on what they've done, and tell me if you disagree, but based on what they've done with Crusader Kings 2, I've got a pretty good confidence that they will be able to do the same thing uh, with Hearts of Iron 4. Um, it'll just be one of those things where, like, if you don't have that expansion, you don't get to experience that. But if you have the expansion, then all of a sudden it's a totally different game. No, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I think that's uh, I think they can do it, and I think they should honestly, because there's a there's a. I mean, the thing is, there's a community behind it. There's a ma- there's I, I mean, significant portion of a com- of a paradox community that have been like, hey, look, if you make a Cold War game or even a modern era game. I will buy it. And, you know, like, I, I always, always kind of, cons- like, wor- uh, con- you know, when Hearts Iron 2 and uh, Hearts Iron, well, around Hearts Iron 2 it was coming around, they did make some expansion packs like Doomsday and I think Armageddon, which did incorporate parts of, uh, I think there was even, uh, it went up to the Korean conflict. Those like, were almost like the... separate games, though, weren't they? Like, I feel like oh. some of those expansions didn't even really, they weren't really Hearts of Iron at the core. And they weren't even official. They were just like, so and so created this mod, and I, maybe they sold them. I don't know, but it wasn't. It didn't. It wasn't really the core game in the sense that, like Crusader Kings Two, is the core game. It's sold by Paradox, and all these expansions are sold by Paradox, even though they're different games. Like these things, almost felt like they were developed by someone else. And I don't know enough. Maybe they weren't, but it felt like they were. It, 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 I mean, it did. I mean, there was a lot of changes. I believe in um, in both those uh, in a couple of those expansion packs. I remember like playing it and they I, I remember some of them even redrawn the uh, map borders um, of Hearts Iron 2 to this new expansion pack. I was like, oh wow, they changed I remember looking at it, I remember thinking like, oh wow, they changed a lot in this game and it was it kind of felt like, oh, they did a lot of work and you kind of felt like, all right, I feel a little bit better spending whatever money I spent on it, whether it was 10, 20 bucks, I felt a little bit better, but um, you just got to wait to the Steam sale where everything's like 90% off of all the 90 million different expansions that Paradox has for their, their games. Yeah, I, you know, that I, 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 haven't, I haven't, I wasn't buying Steam games until like, a, I think a year or two ago. It wasn't until like I realized Steam was actually big. Uh, I, I thought on, in the beginning Steam wasn't going to take off. And I, I wasn't cool because I remember they had like a, uh, they have a little bit of a DRM policy and, um, um and they still do. Uh, I, w- I wasn't cool with oh, that. No, I, was, no. I was kind of one of those people that like, look, I want the physical disc because I always want this game. I want to put it on as many computers as I want and give it to my friends and stuff like that. But times have changed. Well, uh, I mean, I <laughs> as, as we're speaking, I literally just picked up a box copy of Scourge of War Waterloo, Command Modern Air Naval Operations, Eagle Day oh, wow. Bombing the Reich. I mean, I still enjoy buying physical box copies and maybe that's a discussion for a different podcast, but yeah, I hear where you're coming from. I love the box art. I mean, that's the one thing I miss. I love. I used to put like buy the box art and like almost like show it off on like on a desk. Like I would make it like the feet. Like you know, when I would head over to the desk, I would see a box art. Especially because Scourge of War has a beautiful box art. Uh, I do miss that, but I don't know. I, I honestly. You know, I'm moving everything to a digital form. I used to buy books, and I uh, I used to never read them because I was like, I'm not carrying this around. So I, I buy everything digital now. And uh, there's pros and cons because, like, I used to love you know looking at the covers and the box art for books and for games. But um, I think the ability of having everything digitally. Uh, one cool thing I love about Steam is like. You know, I can if I ever before when I used to buy the CDs and if they break or the bottom of them and get scratched so much that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really, uh, uh, the, the DVD couldn't read them anymore. Steam, you can have it for life. You know, if you bought a game like five years ago, you still have it, even if, you know, your computer crashed out on you. Just Until the ton- uh, the unimaginable happens in five years and Steam goes out of business. <laughs> I, I have a... I don't know if Steam will ever go out of business. The amount of people on them, they have like probably like what, uh, half a million people on at any one given moment. I mean, that's true, but that's that's the case for any big business when they're successful in the, in the given era. But, you, you know, I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, I, I would say I buy most of my books electronically. I do think there's, to me, there's almost like a, you know, you're going to set up your den, you're going to set up your, your living room like as, a, as an aesthetic aspect. Um, 
physical copies of, of items still have value to some extent. Um, and there's something about like, especially with books, like when I'm reading a book in person, like there's, there's something about having it in my hand where I feel like I retain more because I've got that physical copy that I'm reading with my eyes in person. Whereas like if it's an audio book or if it's a digital book and I'm reading through an electronic screen, I don't know if I retain the same, the same level of information, but that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about Hearts of Iron 4, and uh, I guess, what's your overall take of it? Because, you know, I, I, and I'll just preface, preface this with, I have always been interested in the Hearts of Iron series, but that's one of the games, like, I've talked about my strategy background. Hearts of Iron, I didn't even know Hearts of Iron 1 or 2 or 3 existed until kind of talk started kind of culminating around Hearts of Iron 4. And then people were like, oh, have you checked Hearts Iron 3? And I remember like a Gamer's Gate sale uh, had like Hearts of Iron 2 on sale. And I picked that up. And uh, or, or no, I, actually I found it in uh, a Half Price Books where I found a copy of it. and mm-hmm. But I never really played it. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, Half, uh, half Price Books is kind of like a book reseller. So you bring your books in, you sell them to them, and then you buy you know used books. Uh, but they also have hardware um, and software. Um, but... I never really knew Hearts of Iron existed until I would say just shortly before Hearts of Iron 4, you know, six months or so before Hearts of Iron 4 came out. And then I found Hearts of Iron 2 in a, in a half price books, found Hearts of Iron 3 on Steam, and I never really fell into either of them. So my real first deep exposure to Hearts of Iron 4, Hearts of Iron, was Hearts of Iron 4. And I will say that from an outsider's perspective, it was incredibly easy to figure out. It was frustrating to some extent. But it was incredibly easy to figure out. The pre-war and the economy and all that was really well modeled. The events were all really well modeled. My main complaint was it felt like the first three or four years of the game were really fun if you start in the 1936 year. But by the time the war starts, things get just way too abstracted. Like, okay, so I tell Bradley or I tell von Rundstedt or whoever it may be, Okay, take your army here and form this front line here. But I, it, it doesn't feel like a war game at that point. It feels like the first four years of the game are critical. And then, okay, it's just kind of, you know, I'm watching the AI uh, do the orders I gave them. But I don't really feel like it's a war game at that point. I almost feel like it's a political, economic sim for four years. And then I just oh, kind of wow. watch, you know, what I created play out i i don't know what your take is because i know you play you said you mentioned you played uh, hearts of iron 3 and um i guess what's your take yeah i mean uh i, I was kind of surprised when you said that because um uh they, their intent i think when they were making the game and a lot of people uh community was were worried that like wait how hands-off is this game because hearts iron 3 there was a lot of hands-on in terms of the military like uh, hearts iron 3 i remember like you know uh you know you uh, develop your uh, divisions, your corps, your armies, your uh, uh, army groups, then your theaters. Uh, there was a lot of movement, and then you had to assign division commanders, corps commanders, army commanders, and then and so on. And it was a lot of stuff, and you were controlling each division or each corps. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was really interesting. Um, but you don't you don't, like, you don't have that in Hearts of Iron Four. It's like armies. There's no there's yeah, no core division level. And I mean, you can you can uh, and a lot of times uh, the AI, AI is not as um, and no AI is like perfect. But I've noticed uh, there's a lot of times where I'll give you a good example. I'm playing uh, Hearts of Iron Four now. I'm playing as British and I'm going from North Africa and moving west uh, against the Italians. And I told, uh, I wanted to try out this offensive movement. Um, and I, I was just like, all right, I'm going to give AI the control now, which I'm very, which is very hard for me to do. Cause I'm, uh, I really get to my, I like getting my hands, uh, uh, you know, deep into the battle. Uh, so I said, all right, I need, uh, I'm giving you eight divisions and they're spread over certain like four provinces. I want you guys to go West, hit the Italians and push them all the way down to, um, uh, to uh, like West Africa, all the way to uh, almost where Gibraltar. Hey, 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 hey! 
be nice to the Italians, okay? I'm like I'm like forty percent Irish, but I'm also like thirty percent Italian. So be you know don't don't be too mean to the Italians there. Well, you, know? you got to remember the British have Montgomery, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they just uh, they just want a good bottle of wine and you know some, you know some nice companies and you know. But you know anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so basically, I told them to go west, and um, I wanted to, you know, and I didn't want to deal with Africa. You know, like this is the one time that I wanted to use the AI. I was like, look, I don't want to deal with Africa. You deal with this. I'm gonna go focus on my drive to Berlin. So I told the AI go west. And I came back like a month or like a couple of weeks later. I was like, all right, let me move back down, see what's going on in Africa. And they're still in the same provinces. They move like one province over. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? And I noticed the AI was, um, it, it got like one province. But it was really weird because it, 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 it wasn't working properly. It was like I had, they were attacking, uh, there were three provinces. Uh, the Italians were surrounded from the north. Uh, and they were uh, they were British on the east, and they were British in the south. So almost completely surrounded. But the AI was only attacking from the east. So I was like, and they were like, and the battle was like 50-50. And I was just like, why aren't the units in the north? They were just sitting there. They're not even moving. Who are, I'm right. sorry, who are you playing as in this scenario? Who is the British? Okay. So they have British in the north and south of the Italians and in the east. But only the... Eastern forces were attacking the Italians. So it was like the battle was 50-50. It was give and take. And I was like, why aren't the forces north and south of the Italians engaging to do combined arms? So as soon as I told those units to attack, the battle went to like 80% or 90%. And eventually I, I kicked the Italians and moved them uh, west. And, I, and I've noticed that like throughout the, uh, throughout the game, I was just like, why aren't you doing this? There are clearly like five divisions here that can support the attack that are not doing nothing. Um, so I noticed the AI is not as good as it, it should be. And But, you know, I mean, no AI is perfect. But there's a few things in the game that I've noticed that um, they're not up to where I would love it to be. Like uh, certain things in my review, I haven't posted my review, but certain things that I've, I've noticed uh, that I've noticed are uh, there are a couple of game crashes that really – not big ones, not as much as Hearts Iron 3, <laughs> uh, but there are a few game crashes I noticed. Um, the one thing I was hoping, I was so dying for them to put this in, was in Hearts Iron, I think, and I know in Hearts Iron 2 was in it, and I believe Hearts Iron 1 it was in. I'm a single player person, so like, I play Hearts Iron, like, usually when I have drag, I'm home or I'm at, you know, and, uh, or out of school, I usually come home and I play the game. And I, I, I don't do multiplayer because I like playing it on my uh, terms. So if I play the U.S. or England, in Heart to Iron 2, you had this section in diplomacy where you can hit assume control of allied forces, which basically says, all right, if I select this button and the allied uh, country said, yeah, that's fine, you can control all of me. I would control all French forces. I can literally say, all right, I have now command of all French Belgian and Netherlands forces. In essence, I'm Eisenhower. I can control all those forces, and I can do it with them as I wish. No, that that that's war in the Pacific or war in the West. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm making like, a joke. Like, but you mean like the? Is that another game? Yeah, the Matrix games, uh, War in the Pacific, or uh, War oh, in the yeah, West. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Basically, become that, and I. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, in Hearts Iron 2, you could do that. And in Hearts Iron 3, you couldn't. And, but toward, like in Hearts Iron 3, they came out with, like, I think an expansion pack where they say, all right, well, you can select on a province and you can press, like, British and English, uh, British, I'm sorry, <laughs> British and French forces to go to those provinces and they'll try their best to get there. And the system was kind of, like, weak. It wasn't that good. Uh, and I, I was hoping in Hearts Iron 4 that they would, like allow this option where I can control French forces. So right now I'm like on my way to uh, Berlin as the British forces. I can't even control the French forces. You can't even select a province and say, all right, I need your French forces to go here. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I hate to interrupt you here, but I had a similar experience where I was, I was playing as Italy and, uh, I, I went kind of an in Italy independent route and, um, 
I ended up at war with Germans, and the second really? I went to war with Germans, the Russians and the British and the Americans all joined my side. But I have no control <laughs> over what they do. So we invade like through southern Germany, but it's really the Russians and the Americans doing all the work. And it's just this hodgepodge of like, oh, one American province surrounded by three Italian provinces with like a Russian province over here on the right. And it was just like, it was just a mess. It was like, okay, this is not at all how a combined arms allied, you know, advance would, would exist. And to your point earlier about the AI being somewhat weak in Hearts of Iron 4, it's interesting that you say that because I kind of had a different experience. So, and this is admittedly my very early in coming to Hearts of Iron 4 as a complete novice. Uh, so we'll put those, those prefaces out there. But I was playing as Italy and I decided, okay, I've taken Ethiopia and I've taken, I can't remember who else I took, maybe Albania, Ethiopia, and I was looking at invading Yugoslavia. Oh. And, okay, makes sense. You know, it, Italy historically invaded Yugoslavia, and, uh, you know, not, Hitler had to bail out the Italians because it went disastrously. But from my, you know, the historical gamers, uh, supreme Italian forces, everything should go smoothly, right? So I invade Yugoslavia. And I'm advancing. You know, we take the capital. They they withdraw their capital to the south. Everything is going smoothly. Everything looks perfect. Italy is about to conquer Yugoslavia. Well, I may not have been the most observant of supreme commanders. And I may have allowed the just one tiny little sliver along the coast of Yugoslavia to not be part of my front line. You know how you establish a front line when your troops mm -hmm. advance? Um, I didn't tell my general to, you know, have his whole front line run to the coast. I didn't know I didn't do that, but I didn't. And my troops kept advancing and advancing and advancing. And there's this one little province here in the corner that I, I ignore. And, you know, the AI, you know, by your experience, it doesn't sound like the AI was terribly good for you. But in my case, the Yugoslavian AI said, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> this idiot left uh, the corner province along the Adriatic open. And it's a clear line of supply to the rest of our forces. So we're just going to swing in around. And we'll go through this little sliver, swing in, and then advance north and cut the entire Italian army off. And 500,000 Italians dead. So wow. I was an idiot. Got my entire, most of my army destroyed because the AI saw that I left one province absent as my front line was established. And it said, you're a fucking idiot. We're going to advance around you. We're going to cut your entire army off. And we're going to destroy the second Roman Empire before it gets going. And in my experience, I mean, to me, like, I don't expect an AI to be perfect. You know, I realize that it's a computer, it's, you know, it's limits are, uh, humans have very dynamic brains, everyone's different, you know, people are going to think of different strategies. It's kind of impossible to program a computer to think of every possible strategy. But in my case, I left one, literally, literally was just one hex along the coast open. And the AI took advantage of that without mercy and immediately, like it wasn't a matter of like, oh, I just kind of missed it. It was a matter of literally the second I started advancing and this one province was open, it realized that I made this fucking mistake and just advanced around me, cut off 30 plus Italian divisions, destroyed them by cutting off their supply. And I was embarrassed embarrassed i think i live streamed it but then i didn't post it on my youtube channel because i was just like i'm an idiot i'm not gonna post i'm not gonna post that it just makes me look like dumb um and i'm talking about it of course um but yeah i mean it, it, i had a different experience with the ai so it's kind of interesting that you feel like the ai didn't really live up to your standards whereas in my case like you know i it kicked my ass i i mean i i mean I wouldn't say like all of it. I mean, it was just, I mean, it's, it's probably, it works probably like 80 to 90% of the time. Well, uh, it was just that 10, 20% of the time that I noticed, uh, cause like, you know, like my Eastern front, I, I told one of my generals is like, go to Berlin and it's doing a fairly well job. And then I have like a Southern front cause the Germans and Italians 
really done. The AI is really, like I would have to say, is really good because what it did is the, uh, the Germans and Italians actually uh, um, pushed uh, from the east to west uh, along the uh, Belgian, Netherlands, and French borders, and they're like pushing there. But they also went through um, southern France and are coming up. And I actually had a, uh, I, I put one of our, my generals there, I forgot his name. But I told him, I was like, look, I need, I'm giving you 20 more divisions, hold this front, and then advance. And he, he's actually doing very well. And, um, but, I mean, it kind of leads one interesting thing that uh, I really like the game. I think the visuals are incredible. The graphics are crazy great. Uh, I just, I, f- I, I don't know how I feel about the more of the hands-off method. I know you can go hands-on by uh, turning off the general and kind of going in, but I, I feel like uh, a little bit's been taken out that um, I call it uh, in terms of like uh, assigning like divisions, corps, armies, and army groups. Uh, I feel like uh, a lot's been stripped out there. Uh, now, I, whether that's good or bad, I, I, I haven't decided. Uh, this the, the the system that they might have is might be perfect. I just I'm not used to it. And I feel like as a hard giant free player, I'm not used to it yet. Uh, it's kind of like when people went from Iowa, when Apple went from iOS 6 to iOS 7, and everything's been changed, you know, everybody's like, well, I don't like it. Well, you don't like it yet, because it's new. And a lot of people don't like new things. I uh, Just get used to it, and I feel like I'm still in the process of getting used to it. Yeah, and it seems to be a common, I would say, like, my perspective, I'm coming in with someone who spent, like, literally, like, look at my Steam account. I spent, like, 45 minutes playing Hearts of Iron 3. And I don't know what I spent playing Hearts of Iron 2, but it's less than 45 minutes. Um, which is stupid because I spent money on a product that I didn't play. Um, but coming from a Hearts of Iron 4 being my fresh perspective, brand new user, never really played Hearts of Iron before, really easy to pick up. But that seemed, your complaints around Hearts of Iron 4 seem to be very common complaints for anyone who's played Hearts of Iron previously. It seems like almost like Hearts of Iron 4 is designed to appeal to the new user, whereas uh, it's not designed to appeal to the Hearts of Iron supporter of Hearts of Iron 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. I I think you're right. I think they're trying to go a little bit more mainstream, which which is fine. I mean, it is it is what it is. I just uh, there's certain as a Hearts of Iron three player there's certain things that I'm uh, like I'll give you a good example I'm doing like reviews for Stellaris and Hearts of Iron four at the same time which is probably not a good idea but it is what it is um, I know I so you're just a you're just a paradox fanboy basically yeah <laughs> I mean you know they they I mean ever since Victoria and Hearts of Iron one was I I, I was hoping, but, I mean I don't blame you they're kicking you a hundred grand a month I mean you know it's it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, they they are making uh, quite a bit of money off that. I wish I uh, put in. Uh, I wish I put in stock the moment they uh, they, they uh, hit the market. I would have made a lot of money. Hey, hey, hey! That's a discussion <laughs> for a different podcast. We'll talk about Paradox <laughs> being a publicly traded company another time. Um, yeah, that, but anyway, that, but um, no, I mean, like there are a couple of systems I have to get used to, um, uh, and, and like all games, you have to get used to. But I mean, going from Stellaris and Heart to Iron. Um, and I don't know if it's because I'm a Hearts Iron 3 fanatic and I go to Hearts Iron 4, but I can tell you when I picked up Solaris, the learning curve on Solaris was like, I never played a space combat game since, uh, uh, what was it, like Birth of the Federation, which I don't know if many people are familiar. It's a Star Trek game from 1999. And you, it's it's kind of like a Master of Orion, but for Star Trek. Huh. Um Interesting. And I, I, I was hesitant to get into any like space combat game because no one has really done a good one. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to say, well, there's a lot of other ones that like Homeworld and stuff like that. But Hey, Distant Worlds. Yeah. <laughs> I actually like Distant Worlds. I, I played that I a little bit, but that. I've never been a 4X gamer. So I've never really been one of those people who's like, I have Sins of a Solar Empire, but it was, I'm, I'm horrible. Uh, it was on sale. I spent like 10 minutes in that game. Um, and I played Distant Worlds a fair amount as part of kind of like a co-op, kind of a really interesting project that a couple of other YouTubers put together where there are like 30 different people and each person played one year as ruler of the country and passed it on to the next person. It was really interesting. Um, but that's probably the only Forex game I've spent any time and I haven't really played Stellaris yet. Well, I mean, the I mean, the really uh, now you mentioned the other games. I uh, I think I 
played a few of them, but I never caught on. I, I, I think um, that might have touched since the Solar Empire. But anyway, Solaris, with the really cool thing about Solaris is like I, I put it on and everything was like unusual. Like it was different. I never played a game like there was no Solaris priest. You know, like this is the first Solaris game, so I never played it before. So I got into it. And for me, like, especially when, you know, coming from like a, like a company like Apple, like the first thing I always, I never believe, I don't believe in tutorials. I believe you need to put a device or a game into somebody's hands and within minutes they need to like, if they can't get it within minutes, then it's a, you re, you need to redesign it. John, because they, John, you call yourself yeah. a war gamer and you expect <laughs> people to pick things up in like two minutes. I mean, it's just, you know. It, it, I, I guess it's probably ingrained from, you know, like my job. It, it's <laughs> something that, you know, like I, I feel like deep down inside it should pick up. No, um, but I mean, like, and I mean, realistically, this is a topic for a different podcast, but um, I think that's a valid point because, like, again, kind of my formative games were Civil War Generals 2, Panzer General, and Sid Meier's Gettysburg. And I've fallen in love with things like War in the Pacific and, you know, other much deeper strategy games. But all those three games I mentioned up front, Sid Meier's Gettysburg, Panzer General, and, oh, good Lord, I've been drinking too much whiskey. I can't remember the third Civil War General? Civil War General, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not drinking anything, no one. Please don't discriminate <laughs> against me. Um but those three games are fundamentally like anyone can pick these games up and figure them out. So, yeah. I mean, to your point, that's true. And yeah, I right. don't even remember why I interrupted you. That. You're right. So, I mean, like, I think it's interesting. Like, the, the classics within the genres are games that would apply to that, that logic of, like, you should just be able to pick it up. You don't even need a tutorial. You just pick it up and figure it out. And, um,. You know, you said that Stellaris kind of does that. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about Stellaris, I picked it up uh, within, like, literally minutes. I was like, all right, I'm good. Uh, I, I did my first impressions, and, like, within, like, 10, 15, a couple of minutes, I was like, I, I, I kind of get the whole game already. Like, I, I know how to, I know what each section does. I know how to, like, move units, this and that. And I was already off and running. I'm, I can tell you right now, I, I've played a lot of Hearts of Iron 4. Um, I still haven't figured out. And maybe it's because it's so new, and I'm and I put in my review. I'm putting it in my review. That it's I'm just because you're such a grog. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I'm such a fanatic with Hearts Iron Three Man too. Like I'm, I'm putting that in. Um, that I, I haven't gotten like the production screen. I haven't figured that one out yet. I just not master, but I kind of get the Air Force screen, like how to move air units. Are these, these these items that fly, they're not on the ground. They're kind of, you know, like 10 or 20,000 feet. I know it's hard to imagine, but they're they're above the ground, and they drop weapons on the ground, and it hurts people, but they're not physically moving on the ground. It, but, you know, I mean, honestly, the uh, moving from, like, the air system in Hearts Iron 3 to 4, they completely revamped. It's, like, complete, like, okay. night and day difference, so... And I'm being an ass. I mean, like, I've never played Hearts of Iron. I, I played it, but like I said, I played it for like 30 minutes, so I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, and they treated heart, the air system in Hearts Iron 3 the same as the naval and army system. Like, I mean, the way you move units kind of, uh, it, they're very similar, but um, completely different in uh, Hearts Iron 4 between the army system and the air system. Okay. So I think kind of the, the, the vibe I'm getting from you is Hearts of Iron 4 simplifies things. Um, and if we're going to be a, a grog, we're going to say fuck paradox because everything's going really <laughs> simplified. Um, Stellaris, fuck, it's too simple. Um, we need to go back to uh, abacuses or whatever to figure out like what's actually going on. Um, but but long story short, from my perspective as being a brand new person to Hearts of Iron 4, it was really interesting. Um, and I thought it was uh, easy to pick up and play. Uh, from your perspective, fuck you, you change things. Um, but hey, you know, it's, it's, it's okay because, you know, it's doing okay. And uh, Stellaris was, was different. I need to really dive into Stellaris because I haven't played that a whole lot. Um, and I think where we really started this, this wasn't the discussion that we were planning on going at all. Um, but I think, and 
single malt scotch, you know, screw me because I'm drinking blended scotch right now. <laughs> um, I think the direction we originally intended to go was focused more on, um, I don't even know, what, it wasn't what we talked about. Um, but, good lord, I can't even remember what I was, what I was going to say. Like the, uh, mo- uh, games and modern uh, warfare. Yeah, we'll talk about that in another podcast, because frankly, we were an hour into this one. Um, long story short, I enjoyed Hearts of Iron 4. Sounds like you enjoyed it, although it's different than Hearts of Iron 3. Uh, it's a shame that East and West has been abandoned. However, East and West is something that will be, uh, you know, hopefully we both assume, at least I, I assume you agree with me, that uh, to some extent uh, DLC within Hearts of Iron 4 will address the uh, East versus West game. You know, it's interesting because I would say some of the other games, uh, I hate to say this because I'm a big proponent of like, if you like a game, you should buy it. You should, you should just, frankly, you know, you really like something, go out there and buy it. Um, but f- there was a period of time where I was in high school and I had no money and it was just kind of like, oh, these games are interesting and I'm really interested in history. And I downloaded a lot of games through things uh, that may me not be entirely uh, within the normal purchase uh, path for a game. <laughs> Um, it's for it. <laughs> I, I, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so I downloaded a game called Balance of Power. And did you ever play Balance of Power? That sounds familiar. Why is that? Uh, who made that? I don't even know. I have no idea. You know, because obviously I was buying it through completely legitimate means. I knew exactly who the publisher was and who was buying it from. Um, but I downloaded Balance of Power and Balance of Power Two, and there were these really interesting Cold War games where it was kind of like, con- you know, conflicts over, you know, who has the most influence in a given region. And I feel like, and I'm worried, because Hearts of Iron 4 has the opportunity to address the Cold War. You know, it's a game that's built for 1936 to 1945, but it doesn't feel like that's what it's really built for. It feels like it, it has a bigger opportunity. And I think we both agree here that there's a bigger opportunity for this game to to address um, more than just World War II. But I worry that it's it it doesn't do that, and I worry that we don't release an expansion that fully focuses on the Cold War. I really hope it does. I really hope it takes East versus West and says, you know, screw these developers who couldn't put it all together on time for us. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to put it together. We're going to release it, and it's going to be great. And I I hope that's all that happens. But I worry that it doesn't because there are not enough games that focus on the Cold War and the unique aspects of it. And I feel like, and again, the computer generation was just getting going at this time, so it makes sense that it focused on it. But Balance of Power was a really interesting game where you played as either the kind of the U.S. or as the Soviets. I don't know if you could play as the Soviets, actually, but you definitely played as the U.S. as you kind of try and manage these relationships with different countries. And that's something that Hearts of Iron 4 is really going to need to address. Because right now, it's really just a conflict game. It's build up your military and invade so-and-so. And, uh, you know, if you have a bigger military, you'll succeed. But the proxy conflict is really lacking. And that's something that they're going to need to address if they really intend to address the Cold War. And I don't know if they do, you know. I think we both assume they will, but I don't know if they really will. I think the diplomacy system uh, needs to get... If it's going to go to Cold War, it has to have a revamp uh, diplomacy system. Or Isn't that the case for every strategy game? Like, anytime any strategy game we're talking about any game, they're like, yeah, it's a really, gay, really great uh, war war system, but, you know, their politics suck. <laughs> I, I think uh, I'm trying to think of a paradox game that had a really good uh, diplomatic system. I, I, I like EU, EU four system, Europa Universalis four system. I think that one's really cool. I like that system. Did you play a lot of EU four? I have it, but I really haven't spent more than a few minutes in it. I have. I played a lot. I played a lot of hours of EU four, but I I got really upset because like I, I put a lot of hours into it. I was England. I played for like a hundred, hundred fifty, or whatever years. I just played a lot of it. And then one day, I I, uh, I took like a month or a month and a half break. I forgot why. It, was, uh, it might have been like a product launch or something that was going on. And I got back to it after everything calmed down. 
First of all, how dare you interrupt your wargaming life with real world, you know, work experience? I know, right? I was like, I was like, man, I came back to it. I was like, holy crap, I haven't played this game for that much. I was like, damn it. But so I, I launched the game, and then like, and this is what drove me nuts. I, I, the game was like, like grayed out, like in a launch game uh, section. I was like, why the heck is this grayed out? And I, I forgot what I did, but I remember I clicking on it or I clicked archive or something like that. It allowed me to load the game and it said, uh, the game is just not corrupt. I forgot what it said, but somehow an update was installed to Europa Universalis that made the game that I was playing. Uh, like it, it didn't, it, it didn't jive together. So it launched the game, but everything was like just jacked up. And I remember I was like, oh, okay, cool. So everything I did so far in the last 150 years has been all jacked up. Can't play the game. Um, and I, I kind of feel like that's a, a a paradox thing where like they're constantly, you know, and maybe this will go back, goes back to Hearts of Iron 4 because this could be a completely separate discussion for a separate podcast for a separate day. But I almost wonder if the game they release on day one, like I've seen people be like, oh, this isn't really great. You know, it's it's not for me. I'm a huge Hearts of Iron 3, Hearts of Iron 2 fan. It's too simple. Um, but they'll get there. You know, they'll get there after five or six mods. Um, and I kind of wonder, do they release the sanitized version to appeal to most people who can buy it? You know, to fund the development of the ultra hardcore grognard game that comes out three years after launch like look at crusader kings 2 it was this very kind of simple you play as a christian country uh within a small period of years and today it's literally open sandbox but when it was released it was not so is hearts of iron 4 going to turn into that where the release is a world war 2 1936 to 1945 simulation but by the end of it it'll be really like not really even about 1936 to 1945 realistically it'll be about the cold war and you know that's just the preamble with with world war 2 I hope I really do and I hope they push it all the way to the modern war cuz uh like modern era um which would be I mean, a game like that is needed. I mean, I can't even think of the last game that I played was a Modern War. I, I don't know if you ever heard of Superpower. That was probably the last game that I've... Yes, yes. Okay, so we're talking about foundational games of our strategy, and I, 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 you know, I'm shorting myself because it's like, oh, these three games define me, but every game we talk about, it's like, oh, it's it's a big part of who I am. Um, so Superpower 1, I played the... That was a great game. Just, oh my god, I played so much of it. Played it as South Africa, took over all of Africa. Um, <laughs> just, got, you know, it was the perfect place to play as, because, like, as the U.S., okay, great, everything's easy. As the Russians, great, everything's easy. Even if the Germans or British or French, like, you got a lot of money, whatever. But, like, South Africa, it was like, you got this whole continent, you can just overrun. Um, so, yes, I played a lot of South, or a lot of Superpower. Um, and did you play Superpower 2 at all? No, I didn't. Um, I, I no, I, I might have played it, but there were certain things like I, I got lost with the unrealistic things. Like uh, I liked playing Superpower. I thought it was a great game because like it was, it was the first developer to say, "Hey, let's make a game about like today," um, which I thought was awesome. Um, but there were like certain unrealistic things, like man, like you were saying, like South Africa taking over the whole continent. Hey, hey, if, if I'm in charge, it's realistic, okay? <laughs> but I mean, like the one real thing, like. There was a lot of weird stuff in that game where I, I forgot. I remember there was a tactical portion that, like, you know, like, it, you had a picture of, like, of like a swamp, but, like, none of the terrain affected the battle, you know? It was kind of, like, weird stuff like hey, that. Hey, don't expect realism, okay? Just <laughs> the graphics look good, okay? But, you know, it was stuff like that that bothered me. So, I mean, it, I lost that realism, so I, I fell back on Hearts of Iron 4. Like, oh, I'm sorry, Hearts of Iron 2 or whatever out at the time uh, and I fell back to that I remember that stumbling ap- across Superpower 2 and again I hate to say uh, half price books because it feels like half the games I played 
or as a result of half half price books. You know, I would always stumble in there. There was one pretty close to where I lived, and you know, I was always like, "Oh, these are really cool, cheap history books." And you know, in some cases, there were software available, and then I was like, "Holy, holy crap! There's a lot of really good value war games in here." And this is before Steam, and I ended up stumbling across Superpower Two, which was great. I love Superpower One. This kind of really bare bones, you know, really rudimentary graphics. You know, you got kind of like a generic grid that you build technology up. And then I got Super Mario 2. And it was like a cartoon. It was just like oh, these weird little cartoon figures like shape across the the country and uh, they get pissed at each other and everyone nukes each other. But it, it, was, it was a totally different game and a totally different experience. And um, it was it was rather disappointing, um, but Superpower One I played a ton of played in South Africa um, mostly um, because you could kind of do whatever you wanted, and um, it was a nuclear option. I remember that, right? Yeah, no, there was, and it was almost like it was an import from the game Defcon when it came to the nuclear option. East um, versus West was supposed to have that too. I remember. Shoot. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, it'd be interesting, and I think developers today would struggle to sell much because, you know, we're not in the middle of the Cold War anymore. Um, but I think a, a, a good nuclear sim is something that we're missing out on. Um, you know, something like Bravo Romeo Delta. Did you ever play that game? No, that's not true. Uh, so at one point in time, it was voted as the worst game of all time. Um, oh, well, maybe I should play it then. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a brilliant game, in my opinion, um, because obviously I'm clearly providing a clear view of the credibility of this podcast. Um, but it was a brilliant game in that it basically put you in the shoes without any graphics or any animation or anything that was going on, but it basically put you in control of the American or the Soviet military forces, not military forces, specifically nuclear forces, as a nuclear war breaks out. And it like starts out with, like, oh, you can initiate three nuclear strikes. But then as the enemy takes out different capabilities of yours, you expand the number of warheads you can use to eventually, like, if things go way out of hand, and it just it's called Armageddon, and you can use whatever you want. But obviously the problem at that point is the enemy's launching, like, 500 nukes at you, and everyone loses in that case. So sort of this idea of, like, can you figure out a way to like selectively target where you cripple the enemy's ability to respond against you, but at the same time like win, where it's like you cripple their response, but you're still okay, so it's not a... Anyway, I'm, I'm, we've been rambling for a while now. It's like an hour and a half, um, and we're way off our original topic. Uh, but it is an interesting game, and I... Um, yeah, anyway, uh, sorry to, 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 to go way off topic. Um, I think we went off the rails like 40 minutes ago, so <laughs> if anyone's actually listening, I really appreciate it. And make sure you leave comments on either the Strategy War Gamers or my own YouTube channel. But, um, I, you know, frankly, I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of this, and I want to, you know, make this a regular, um, you know, regular thing that we do maybe it's once a month you know maybe it's more often i don't know um but i'm enjoying the hell out of this it's just i think we probably need to do a better job and this is on me uh of, of tactically laying out like what are we going to talk about how much time we're going to talk about it as opposed to just like rambling for 60 80 minutes about nothing um Hearts of Iron 4 discussion was really useful i think i'm kind of talking so please stop me strategy wargamer john <laughs> <laughs> Hold me against myself. I've been was, drinking too much yeah, whiskey. I Help me. <laughs> I mean, I love the conversation. I mean, uh, I mean, some of the points that you put out was really interesting. I get a. I mean, I think like going back to the thing that you said before is like I really honestly believe, uh, and we're in a golden age. The beautiful thing about I love about today. Um, no, no, the, the war <laughs> gaming is dying. And the, the PC gaming is dying. The world is ending. Like nothing well, is golden I, age. Well, the, the reason why I think it's a, it's such a perfect time is just because, like, programming is getting um, to a higher level language where it's like, you know, like, everybody's getting – and Apple's pushing. And Apple's pushing. Uh, and, and, I, and I believe Google, too, because uh, they just came out. Guys, if he didn't tell you, John worked for Apple, so he may, may be somewhat <laughs> biased. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say, like, I'm, I'm 50-50. I mean, I, I'll be honest. Like, I'm, I'm on – I, I have an iPhone right now, but I'm like on the verge of getting like a Nexus phone because, uh, <gasps> yeah, I, I love. I was thinking, I, I'm like, I'm on the verge of getting like a Nexus Six, but I'm 
kind of like going between Nexus Six and uh, and uh, the Oppo. And, and, and I'm sorry, I, I distracted you. You were were the Golden Age of strategy or something yeah. or other. You were saying, <laughs> but going back, uh, I think we're the Golden Age of strategy because like Google and Apple are putting out some really amazing, um, uh, you know, like uh, I'm trying to find the word, but basically environments where you can develop apps very easily. Um, and, and, and they're like kind of pushing like kids nowadays, like uh, they're making applications uh, where kids can develop and uh, uh, can develop apps or games very easily. But I think like like people, you know, in like, you know, in Europe, uh, kids in Europe and, and the U.S. Uh, have opportunities to get into like programming. And a lot of them are like my, my sister recently, like a couple of months ago, told me she's like, yeah, I, I know Java. I'm like, you know Java? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, you know how to code? She was like, yeah. I was just like, why? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I was just, it's very unusual. She's more into like fashion and stuff like that. But for her to know like programming languages, it kind of like baffled me because I'm, I'm usually the tech person in the family. Huh, um, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I know there are a lot of people out there that are learning programming. And what I love about it is because like it, it kind of opens up an amazing uh opportunity because uh, amazing world because like there's so many people out there and they can make and there's a lot of people that like history games and strategy games and tactical games that i think we should be seeing a lot more games coming out for iphone ipad or mac or a pc or you know android um than we ever will but um it, that in the past because you remember like when we grew up we had like strategy games coming out all the time and I feel like we're on the cusp of magnifying that by like a hundred. You know, we should be seeing like a hundred different Civil War games coming out every month. Uh, what you know, fifty of them for strategy, another fifty of them being tactical games, and like we should be just swimming in strategy games. But um, and I, I think we might already be road- swimming in strategy games. We just don't realize it. I think it'd be interesting to talk about kind of different strategy games to kind of shape your perspective. Cause it, as you were saying that I thought to myself, you know, how does, how does strategy give potentially educate people about things that, you know, we don't already commonly talk about or, you know, war games don't currently, or just games in general don't currently address. And it seems to me like at least the direction you're going down seems to say like, we should be at a renaissance of where we can cover all these unique topics that we've never discussed before. But I don't know if I agree with that. Um, because I feel like when the computer came out, when the internet became accessible, those types of things were already existing. We just didn't know about it, or we just didn't recognize it, or, or you know, they were there, but we just didn't discover it. So maybe Steam, more than anything, allowed us to discover things like that, or the Apple App Store, or the Google Play Store, things like that allow us to s- discover things more easily. But when you say that, I think back to a, a it, was, it was designed as an educational sim, but it's called Escalation which looks at the Vietnam War and puts you... It's basically a school simulation, so it like puts a, a student in the role of LBJ and kind of makes them make some critical decisions. And that was something that I um, uh, got some licenses to way back in the day and ended up playing myself. And it was it was fascinating. Like, if I was to develop a war game, I would... I, I want to... If I was able to code, which I, I need to spend more time not talking to you and learning how to code, um, but if I was to develop a game, it would be something along, it would be something along those lines, where like let's you know that's something that we don't explore. Like Vietnam is just within. Oh, oh my god. Okay, this is gonna go a totally different topic, and we've been talking for an hour and a half, guys. So I apologize because I'm gonna go off on a, a tangent about a conflict that is not covered enough in war games. So cover Vietnam because there is a wealth of opportunity there from a strategy game perspective. Um, I kind of, I agree with you. I think Vietnam is, hasn't been done properly. Uh, I feel like, you know, World War II has, and, you know, a lot of uh, games covered uh, some war and stuff like that. Uh, um, but I, I, I agree with you. I think Vietnam and, has been touched, or even like like the Persian Gulf or something like that, or the Iraq War that, that uh, from two thousand three two thousand four. Uh, none of that has been touched. But Vietnam is fascinating in so many ways, and I'm biased because my dad fought there. But um, 
it's fascinating in so many ways. Like you could play it as a strategic war game from the Viet, you know, the North Vietnam side. Like how the hell do we manage fighting this massive superpower? Or you know, how the hell do you win this war when you can't really invade your enemy, but you kind of have to like stop the flow of supplies coming through areas that you can't invade, and you know, you've got all these restrictions placed on you. Like what do you do? And then from like a first person perspective, like. Okay, you're your squadron, you're a platoon commander. Like, what do you do? But, but, but anyway, like you said, there's there's a ton of opportunity there that's just not explored. Um, but you know, to be honest, we've been talking for an hour and a half now, and uh, we kind of went way off the rails. So, to those who have followed us, uh, we'll do a better job next time of, you know, saying like, here's our topic. This is what we're going to discuss. Um, but this is more of just like a hey, you know. This Welcome to the Strategy Wargamer and the Historical Gamer, Jean. And uh, am I pronouncing it right, Jean? Yeah, yeah, it's French. So yeah, it's it's the French way of saying yeah. Jean and Matt just <laughs> rambling for an hour and a half. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, this is kind of an intro to uh, the the single malt strategy podcast. Um, we will certainly have more structured stuff in the future. Um, I think what are we envisioning? Like once a month, John? Uh, one, yeah, I mean once a month, maybe twice a month, depending uh, on the content. Uh, you know, uh, and or you know the releases. I'm I'm sure like you know, you know in the winter. There's not going to be that many. Like right now, we have Stellaris in our time floor, but I'm sure like down the road, we're not going to have that many um, games coming out. Um, uh, like Gettysburg is coming out in, uh, in, in a month or two. So I would, I would love to talk, uh, cover that. Well, time. you interviewed the developers for that, didn't you? Yeah, I just, I just posted it on, uh, I just posted on uh, my website today. Uh, interview with, um, with uh, one of the market directors for uh, Matrix. And uh, I uncovered a lot of stuff because there was a lot of, lot of stuff that was going on. I, I had in, uh, had like I, I was in contact with um, Eric Smith, I believe his name is, who ran Shenandoah Studios for uh, since its foundation, and uh, I was just trying to figure out like what, what's going on with this game. I was one of the guys who kickstarted that game. I, I spent like eighty million dollars. By the way, that was like the first Kickstarter game I ever <laughs> backed up, and I was like, man, this is awesome. And then nothing happened with uh, Gettysburg, the tide turns, and I was like, okay, that's the last Kickstarter game I ever backed. Hey, 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 you're not alone. I kickstarted the DCS, which I don't know if you're familiar with Flight Sims, um, but uh, I forget what they're even abbreviated for, but DCS, who makes a lot of the really realistic Flight Sims today, um, uh, made kind of a real-world environment where you can play as like a Su-25, kind of basically uh, Russia's version of the A-10, uh, an F-15, you know, a whole bunch of different modern fighters. And they said, we're going to create this World War II um, Western European error environment it may be dynamic but you know something you know you're gonna have fock wolf 190s bf 109s you know, slash me 109s uh p51s b17s all you know you're doing all this and here kickstart us and i kickstarted them and boop, uh, nothing happened it was just like really? um we're not gonna do that anymore they uh, thanks for your money did they say did they say we're not doing it um, I think someone acquired them or something, and it's still being done, but it's not really part of the Kickstarter thing. It's kind of their own thing now, so I'm not really sure. But yeah, similar experience. It's like, so I gave you my money, and it's three years later, and I still see nothing, um, which is a problem with Kickstarter. But did, did they did they tell you like did did they give you any indication like that we're still going on or the pledge is going to be uh, back? You know, I was a horrible consumer and user of this so i have no fucking idea you know i, I don't remember okay. um you but spend a lot of money on it or I think it was like 50 bucks you know it's it a decent amount of money it's like buying a new game but at the same time like i'm not gonna you know end my life over it um lord hopes i don't end my life over 50 dollars um <laughs> But from uh, it's interesting that you you kickstarted the the um, Shenandoah Studios title. Uh, do you do you have any more insight on what happened there? I mean, obviously they got bought out by Matrix and Slither, and maybe this is a topic for a different podcast because we're so far into this one. Um, but I think that might be interesting to kind of discuss what happened there because it seemed like they really had something going for them as far as iOS titles, and then you know all of a sudden they're acquired by Slytherin, and all of a sudden like. 
I don't even know if they still exist in, as an organization or a Slytherin just kind of bought out the the name, you know, where they can say, oh, this is a Slytherin, or, or, or not Slytherin, this is a Shenandoah Studios uh, a title, and, um, you know, just because we say it is, but, like, does that development team still exist, or, or is it just, you know, the rights for the name belong to, to Slytherin? Well, the um, from what the interview with uh, Marco got back to me was, um, and I, I really appreciate Marco answer uh, getting. Uh, he got the interview back to me really quick, which I, I really appreciate. Uh, he um, he mentioned that uh, that when they bought, when they got uh, Gettysburg to tie turns, it was literally. Um, he said that they were that basically all they bought was the shell of the company. The entire development team was gone. They, they were laid off. Um, was that so, before or after they bought them out? Uh. I'm sorry, say it again. Was that before or after they uh, they bought them? Uh, this was, uh, at, like, they bought them. I'm sorry, this was... Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, like, you said the entire development team was laid off. Were they laid off and then they sold the rights of the company? Oh, and no, they no, to... they were laid off before uh, they were bought. Okay, so, so like, like you know, the head of the company says, all right, guys, sorry, this isn't working out. You're all let go, and I'm going to sell what's left of the organization to Slytherin. Yeah, yeah. Like when Slytherin got it, uh, there was like nobody at the company. They just had the uh, intellectual property of the. Because I remember you actually did a like a walkthrough of their development studios at some point. I thought, like, I, I thought I remember watching your YouTube channel and you did like a walkthrough where you kind of, you know, it was just like a basic office. But they're like, you know, ten guys there or whatever that were working on the next uh, Shenandoah Studios title. Yeah, they had a, we had, it was like inside an Indian. I did like uh, interviews with pretty much the whole staff. Uh, and, um, hey, Claude, um, I did a, and I, I've seen the game. Like, I, obviously, I can talk about it now since the whole, uh, you know, the, but I mean, like, when I was talking to him, uh, Eric Smith, uh, and a lot of people don't know about this, but like, um, like, they were almost done with the game when I was there. They were like, listen, you know, like, we have a majority of the game done, we have a lot of the code done. A lot of the art, they showed me some of the art they never revealed. I was like, oh, wow, all right, so you guys are like, pretty much good. And uh, I was like, uh, I didn't even back them at that time. I backed them after that. Um, and he actually brought me to another room. He's like, and, you know, these are other games that were actually uh, in the process of developing. Like, they were, he was already developing the second game, which is supposed to be uh, P. Ridge, um, uh, based on Civil War. And, uh, don't, and, don't do that. Sorry, yeah, I mean, like... Okay, you're gonna go from Gettysburg to Pea Ridge. Like realistically, no one's gonna buy that. I, I, I <laughs> sorry. Well, the, he told me the only yeah. That's why I thought I was like, you going from Gettysburg to Pea Ridge. I was like, uh, he was like, because oh, one of his um, ancestors, once one of his uh, f- uh, family members was at Pea Ridge. That's why he was doing it. Oh, okay. Uh, so sentimental yeah. reasons. Release it as a mod. Don't don't bank the business. On it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like he. Um, I don't know. He uh, he mentioned that he actually had the game for P Ridge out. Yeah, like it was a board game, and I was just like, "So we're we already got this nailed down. Once we release Gettysburg, we're gonna work on this, and you know, it's gonna be released uh, this year or next year." And I was like, "Oh wow!" I was like, "You guys are all set, man." And um, and then like I don't know, like a you know months later, you know the the post got a little further apart. I knew things went. Uh, fell apart after they let go of Bradley or Brandon. I forgot who is the PR contact that I work with. They were, really, they, you know, I, I, I touched base with him. He was like, yeah, I don't work there anymore. I was like, really? He was like, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I got let go. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I was like, okay. And I was like, is anybody there that's PR is like, not that I know of. I was like, okay. I was like, something's really bad down there. And I was like, man, I just invested like, Ninety. I, I don't know how much I invested. Like eighty to hundred dollars. I they came out with like a board game version uh, of the game, which uh, after I found out about this interview, they're not going to be supporting. So, but, wait, uh, they did. That, they did board games also. Yeah. Well, basically, what they were going to do is uh, they were going to release Gettysburg to tie turns, but uh, a few months before the game was going to be released, they were going to release a board game version of it uh, that they worked out with to uh, build up hype. Like what? Yeah, it was supposed to be like, because um, originally they came out with a board game version of Gettysburg, the Tie Turns, and oh, okay. uh, as the basis for the computer game. Huh. And the computer game was like a couple months from release, and they were saying, well, for people that did a pledge of $80, they were going to 
work out with a board game manufacturer to release the board game version of it. So if you're interested in board games, I was getting around to being uh, into board games at the time. I was like, you know what? I might as well pick up the board game version of it and play with some of my buddies with it. But um, that didn't take off. Uh, it, they didn't, uh, obviously, they didn't release any of it. Um, and I just contacted Matrix for this interview. And they were like, yeah, we're not doing the board game version of it. So, I mean, the cool thing about Slytherin, which I really appreciate them doing, is they are going to honor the Kickstarter pledges that Matrix did uh, back in 2013. So they're going to honor those. Oh, that's um, cool. Were they even yeah. part of Matrix at the time? No, no, uh, no, they weren't at all. Oh, so wow. They, that's that's yeah. awesome. That is really cool. I, I, you know, Slytherin, you know, props for you for that because uh, that is really cool that they're going to do that. So if you did invest money into it, at least you're going to get that back some of those. Yeah, I can't say the same for my DCS investment as far as the World R2 flight sim, but whatever. Um, you never know. They might, they might make a post when they were like... It's oh, really interesting. You know, it's... I, I've had my... has. It's interesting because it seems to me like especially the tablet market would be a natural environment for board games or similar to board games uh, as far as like strategy games are concerned. And it seemed like Shenandoah Studios just hit it out of the park with their first two their their cup first couple of games, but it's interesting that things kind of it seems and and maybe they were operating beyond their means the entire time and it was just you know like okay this is taking too long and oh my god we ran out of money and you know yeah we were successful but but not as successful as people think but it's just it's really fascinating to me that you know their first couple of titles were really well regarded and, you know, widely believed to be huge successes. And then, you know, in the midst of releasing their next title, uh, everything fell apart. And it, to me, it sounds like it was almost like a shit. We don't have anything left. I'm going to sell the license of my title and of my games to this third party developer. Cause we went under, you know, it almost sounds like a, a, a garage sale on what was left after it failed already. You know, I, when I first heard that they had been bought out, to me it was like, okay, this successful studio decided to parlay the success into an acquisition. But the way you're describing it is almost like um, they failed—not failed. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean from a from a business perspective, they weren't operating. You know, they had more people that cost more money than they were bringing in. And they had to close shop. They, they they more or less went bankrupt, whether they did technically or not. They you know they couldn't support themselves, and they just sold what was left to, to Matrix and Slytherin. Yeah, and I mean, um, they also I mean a lot of things. Have, I, I I think you're right about that. I think something you know that that had probably a critical factor, but also, I mean, honestly, they get out. I, at probably a good time. The one I, I posted an article like a week or two ago that. It, everything's changing with the tablet market, which is uh, and the app market, which which is really bad. Um, and I hate to see this happen, but it's happening, which really stinks because uh, um, everything back in the day in 27 to probably 2012, 2013, people were buying apps. They were buying apps for like five dollars, seven dollars, ten dollars, um, and they were buying it. And developers are like, look, this is a huge market. Let's hit it. And that's why we were coming out with like, they were. I mean, when I was at Apple, I mean, there were, they were, I mean, there were thousands of apps that were coming out every week. I mean, they were putting people on the uh, teams to like, look, we have to get through these apps and release them within seven days. I mean, there was just a huge push for that. Um, but now it's just like a few hundred apps, if that, every week. And what's happening is the, the market's not slowing down with that. But what's happening is we're going to a freemium model, which is changing the whole app store uh, completely, Apple's and Google's. Um, and I'm not that crazy about it because what's happening is a lot of people don't want to pay. And, and I'm kind of curious about this because a lot of people don't want to pay $5 for an app. They want it for free. You know, Sean, I hate, to, I hate to get you off here, but we've been going for like an hour and 40 minutes, and I, I kind of feel like this is a discussion that I definitely want to have, but I want to have it in detail. You know, I want to spend 30 or 40 minutes diving into into what you're talking about as far as the freemium model because I think, I think there are implications beyond just 
the App Store. I kind of think about, when I think about Steam, I think about these constant discounts where everything's always on sale, and if it's not on sale, no one's buying it. And what are the implications beyond just the App Store for, for mobile devices, but what are the implications for strategy in general uh, now that it has to exist within the Steam model? You know, Steam is the new American Steel. It's the new Carnegie. It's the new, you know, Microsoft. If you don't exist there, you don't exist. Um, and I think it's it's a worthy, you know, discussion to have. But we've been going for almost two hours now. and yeah, um, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I, I, let me just uh, finish off. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I just think that uh, one thing that really kind of um, caused everything was uh, I, I think that Apple was supposed to release something back in 2012, 2013, where you can try out apps for like a day or two. Uh, it was like a trial feature. They never implemented it yet. Um, and I feel like maybe that might have had a... Um, kind of an effect on that, but I think you're right. I think we should dive that into deeper. That we should dive deeper into that in another podcast because I, I feel like that should be like a huge uh, ma- major feature because it's changing the way uh, developers are working with apps. Because I noticed a lot of developers not um, doing premium uh, games for uh, the app stores anymore. Yeah, and it almost seems like developers, whether it's the App Store for mobile or whether it's the Steam Store for for computers, it almost feels like developers feel like they have to, you know, it's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing. And when you devalue your product, what implications does that have long term? Great. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for any other consumer buying the application today. Fine. Great. But what are the implications long term to is there going to be another app out there? Because if it's the same number of people who buy it at three dollars as who buy it at 20, it may not. Um, But again, that's probably beyond the scope of of this discussion. We've been talking for, like I said, almost two hours. It's almost 2 a.m. my time. You're on the East Coast. It's almost 3 a.m. your time. So I don't want to keep you up forever. Um, You and I have been talking for probably about four hours now because we were talking for two hours before we even started recording. Um, So I've had a blast. I hope I I haven't. I I hope you have, too. Yeah, I did, too. Yeah, it it was an awesome discussion. Um, I'm looking forward to episode two. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was half tempted to say, like, okay, let's keep talking, and maybe we'll cut this in two and split this into two episodes. But I didn't find a natural cutting point where it's like, let's stop here and pretend we're in a new episode. (laughs) Um, But uh, so I enjoyed the the time. Um, My name's Matt, the historical gamer. Jean is uh, the the strategy war gamer. You have a a site at uh, www.these. What's your site again? Uh, www.strategywargamer.com. Okay. And I think I'm going to try and set up a site for uh, the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. Uh, It'll probably be like singlemaltstrategy.com or something like that. I haven't really looked into it. Um, but that was you know, good. It may be, yeah, it's just a really good idea. Hopefully no one's taken it so far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in closing, uh, because naturally if we're going to call ourselves Single Malt Strategy uh, Podcast, um, what are you drinking, John? Uh, I was uh, drinking Yingling. Uh, yeah, I uh, had Yingling uh, today because I uh, I killed off all the good stuff on Monday. <laughs> are you not a Yingling fan, or no? I, I do like Yingling, but uh, I'm a big IPA fan. I had a local brewery uh, called El Wapo from o- o- O'Connor's Brewery, and uh, I had a whole six pack, but I, I kind of killed it off Monday and uh, Tuesday. Okay. All right. Well, I've heard good things about Yingling. I've never tried it, but it, it from what I've heard, it's a pre-prohibition style uh, ale. So it's an unfiltered uh, beer that is pretty rare. It's not cold filtered, but again, I'm not exactly a beer expert on the East Coast. I'm myself in the Illinois area. I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, I've been drinking uh, Johnny Walker Green, which was a version of Johnny Walker Scotch that had been discontinued for a while, was recontinued or restarted uh, last year, I want to say. And uh, I've tried to get more into single malts, but the interesting thing is, you know, Johnny Walker, for those of you who are unaware, is kind of a general generic blended Scotch whiskey. So uh, what blended Scotch is, is it's a combination of single malt Scotches, which are Scotches that come from a single port, or is it? pot or port uh, distillery so like uh, for example Glen Levitt would be like a single malt scotch distillery 
uh, but a blended scotch is a combination of those. So maybe multiple single malt distilleries. So maybe you have some Glen Levitt. Maybe you have some, um, oh, good Lord, I can't even think of another single malt uh, um, Glen Fittich maybe. Um, but then you'd also have some grain whiskeys, which would maybe be like just generic kind of lower quality uh, maybe corn or wheat or other you know other grains are involved in it. But I've been drinking Johnny Walker Green Label, which is different because most most blended scotches have, like I said, grain whiskey and single malt whiskey. Uh, Johnny Walker Green, specifically the Green Label, is a blended malt whiskey, which is a blend where it's not just one distillery, it's actually multiple distilleries. However, they're all single malt distilleries. So it's a blend of single malts, uh, which has been really interesting and I've really enjoyed it quite a bit actually beyond just the generic generic, uh, swill that is uh, Johnny Walker Red or Johnny Walker Black, which is okay, but um, certainly there's a a vast difference in quality between uh, black and green. Uh, and yet, green is only like five to ten dollars more expensive. So I've really been enjoying it. Hmm. I might have to pick that up tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow is uh, Thursday, so I usually uh, it's my last day at school. So I, uh, I usually uh, get some uh, nice beer or some uh, liquor. So I might have to pick that up actually on uh, corner liquor store. Yeah, if you run into it, I've been in a few stores and I haven't seen it. Um, but uh, but the one I did see it and I picked it up. Um, so I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, one thing I think is kind of a side note, you know, I know we're two hours in, so maybe I shouldn't be introducing at this point. Uh, but I, I kind of, you know, when I came up with single malt as the name, single malt strategy, um, you know, the, the podcast is really John's idea, the strategy war gamers idea. Um, but I thought like, let's model it on kind of a, we're going to talk about strategy, but we're going to mix alcohol in a bit. And I kind of model it off, uh, war on the rocks, which is a strategy foreign policy website, which focuses on real world issues. So important things, unlike what we talk about. Sorry, star, sorry, John. Um, um, but I'm sure, you know, your military experience, you understand. Um, uh, it talks about you know foreign policy and strategy, but it also mixes an alcohol component, and that's kind of where I came up with like, okay, let's call ourselves single malt strategy. Um, so that's where that name came from. So I'm shamelessly copying that concept, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. So I'm just rambling at this point. I'm really good at rambling. You need to you need to reel me in and like shut the hell up because you're just going on and on. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed the discussion we've had for the last two hours, and um, I'm enjoying the whiskey that I'm having, if anyone who's listening can't already tell. And um, I hope you enjoyed yourself, too. I did. I finished my yingling uh, a little bit ago. So I like to, uh, three hours ago, and you're like, holy <laughs> shit, <laughs> shut the hell up, Matt. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll, have to, uh, I'll have to probably get for our next podcast, I'm going to get that, uh, that uh, green label. <laughs> so I can uh, try out what you have today. Yeah, you'll have as good of a time as I did throughout this whole podcast. Um, all right, guys. Well, with that being said, I think we'll go ahead and we'll cut this uh, this podcast off here. Um, I think we're thinking, what, once a month? Is that what you're, you're thinking? Potentially twice a month, but I'd say, like, bare minimum, like, we're going to do one podcast a month. And if we can get more in, great. But we're going to say we'll commit to doing one a month for, for you folks. Works for me. Okay, well, it works for me. Right, I'd, I'd good like good. to do more, but again, it's it's you know you're three a.m. your time. So, um, anyway, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. This is a historical gamer. My name's Matt. Uh, nice to meet all of you who I haven't met before. Uh, I really enjoyed my time here today. And uh, Jean, did you want to send us out? Uh, thanks for listening, guys, and we'll catch you in episode two.